Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MSP. It's the Ukraine War News Update, second part thereof for the 25th of August 2023. We're going to go uh, to the frontline update uh, to begin with, but I just want to re-dip into this uh, Wall Street Journal article uh, that, I, uh, that I mentioned earlier in my first video. The amount of equipment supplied by the US is sufficient for the counteroffensive of Ukraine. And it is unlikely that the same deliveries will be repeated in 2024. Quote, we've stockpiled this mountain of iron for the counteroffensive. We can't do it again. It doesn't exist, said one former US official. Uh, I just, I'm not too sure about that. It doesn't exist. We can't do it again. M1 Abrams, US have 8,841. They've given 31 to Ukraine. 6,723 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles, 6,000 M113s, uh, 4,187 strikers, um, assault, uh, amphibious assault vehicles, 1,311, 1,500 LAV-25s. Uh, let's go down. Um, armored multi-purpose vehicle, 2,897, uh, so on and so forth. Just thousands upon thousands, Max Pros, 5,250 have been ordered. I uh, don't know how many they have presently. Uh, Oshkosh, 8,108. It's just insane. So on and so forth. It's just a, a phenomenal 260,000 Humvees. 260,000 Humvees of different types. Oshkosh ATV, 19,150 ordered. So when you go back to like this, we've stockpiled this mountain of iron for the counteroffensive. We can't do it again. It doesn't exist. It exists in spades. This is just, it's just not true. It's not true. So some of these people, I think, that are anonymously interviewed by people like the Wall Street Journal, I'm not sure I should be taking them seriously. Anyway. Let's go to the counteroffensive. Or well, actually, we're going to go to Bakhmut first. So this is some footage, uh, and it might be a couple of days old now, uh, taking place to the north of Bakhmut. Uh, so we go to my map here. Uh, my map hasn't been updated yet. It'll be updated between now and, and the counteroffensive frontline update. Sorry, the frontline update, uh, the full video for that. But this, this activity is taking place around Zaleznyansky, to the north of Bakhmut, where we haven't seen activity for some time, actually. There's a massive bit of footage here. My my first video today has already been restricted, so I'm not going to show you too much here. But there is just a, a big old attack by the looks of it. Well, not, not huge. What's interesting about this footage is you see that this is a Miklik. This is firing off a, a mine charge here that... I can only think is actually using that as an offensive weapon, as an assault weapon, rather than actually clearing mines in the middle of a battle. Uh, just, yeah, anyway. So that is, that's activity that is taking place. Uh, Andrew Perpetua's geolocated it to uh, to there. Uh, so there is, yes, yeah, significant uh, military activity taking place north of Bakhmut. Okay, we if we go down to uh, the southern front line, there is a lot going on. So first of all, we'll, we'll look at Urujaini. Uh, there are some claims. What do I have? Claims around Urujaini. So grain, take this with a grain of salt. The Russians from the direction of Zavetny Bezhenia, Zavetny Bezhenia voluntarily surrendered. But I'm seeing more and more Russians give up. Not one or two, but many. And I've seen that. I've seen an awful lot of footage of Russians give up. Uh, Russian POWs. Here, that is in this area, uh, Zavitny Bajanya. I don't know. It's been quite quiet in terms of the information coming out from the Velika Novosilka salient. That's not to say things aren't happening. Of course, they are. But it just the information is quite slim on the ground. Uh, and I've been wondering what's been taking place around Zavitny Bajanya. Anyway, it all seems to be much more about what is taking place in uh, Robotna area. So the map, as according to Pule Volon here, looks rather like this. Uh, the Ukrainians are gaining territory towards Vobove, uh, towards, well, out of Robotna, possibly towards Nova Pivka, and we're going to talk about that in a second. And then south east of uh, Robotna as well. The 
uh, Ukrainian general staff talk about uh, where where do I have it here? So they talk about two axes. This this is actually a quote from the general staff here from Fahed uh, Junior. So in Melitopol direction, the Ukrainians had success in the direction of Nova Danilivka, Nova Pokrovka, and Malatok Machka Ocherevatovate. Uh, they are anchored at the achieved boundaries. That's what the general staff say. So uh, what I'm trying to work out what that means as to these two axes, because one of them is this axis from there, Nova Danilivka to Nova Pokropivka, and the other one is Malatok Machka all the way down to there. So I guess that just means here and there. I don't know, you know, I'm not sure that these two northerly um, settlements are, are relevant to that. Anyway, what's been going on? So after the liberation of the village of Robotna, the armed forces began to gradually push back the Russians into the north of Novopokropivka and in the direction of Kopani, closer to the defence line. Let's go back to my map. So that is to say, and remember, this map is out of date. This is yesterday's, but you'll get an idea of the successes yesterday were around this area. And they are apparently moving towards Nov Novopokropivka having success there and possibly towards Kopani as well uh, and you'll you'll hear towards Vobove too so uh, things are really heating up today in this whole area uh, we will go on uh, to another source here so there are rumors that Ukraine has entered the town of Nova Prokopivka immediately south of Robotna now that would be significant because they appear to then be using their momentum from taking Robotna and going straight to take the next place. Uh, keep on going. And that, that's, I think, really important uh, for offensive forces to do that. Now, it gets better for the Ukrainians, perhaps. You do hear this quite a lot. We heard this with other places like, oh, Ukraine have taken here. And actually, it took them like four days to take that or five days or whatever. So Russian mill bloggers are now claiming that the whole village of Novopokropivka has been taken. Take with caution right now, though, says Global War Monitor. I'd agree with that. But it's interesting to hear that this is coming from Russian mill bloggers. However, the commander of the armed forces did say that 3CY was in the ver on the verge of a breakthrough. So the situation in Zaporizhia uh, region, Novopokropivka, came under the control of the enemy, is the Russian claim. Wow. Uh, not confirmed by the Ukrainian general staff, but Russian sources claim Novopokropivka, just south of Robotny, is under Ukrainian control. If this is true, there is a huge counteroffensive in progress stretching from Kopani to the in the west to Novopokrovka in the east. That's not Novopokropivka, that's Novopokrovka. Novopokrovka, and I'll show you in a second. Fog of war for sure, but the Russians are absolutely panicking right now. Okay, so that is from Kopani in the west there up to Novopokrovka there. So th this whole salient, it, it could well be in the midst of a really big counteroffensive push. In fact, the biggest of the counteroffensive so far. We'll come on to look at some of the claims uh, of what is taking place. But there is significant activity today, that's for sure. So this is Osin Uri saying, lots of rumours have been running around today. Latest information is beginning to provide some clarification. This was posted six hours ago, and he posted this uh, last night, right? So this is last night. So this is back from yesterday afternoon. On the Orokiv segment, so Robotny, the Ukrainians are getting closer to Tokmak. Information is being received that the second line of defense in uh, Katsapny uh, has been broken in two sectors of the front. Fighting is underway in the villages in the Novopokrovka and uh, Novopokropivka and Novopokrovka. Kovka. The Ukrainian armed forces are getting closer to the villages of Above it and Kopani. The Russians are still trying to snap back, but they can't change the situation on this front. The Russians have very large losses and there is nowhere to replenish their fresh meat. It is reported that the Katsaps began evacuating the FSB department and headquarters from Tokmak. That is, that they are doing badly and no longer believe they will keep Tokmak. Uh, today's NASA firm's imagery of Chavonohirka, north of Tokmak, and the area of the AO. So uh, that is to say that there is uh, a lot of activity all over the area we've been talking about, and then firm's activity, so that is fires north of Tokmak. Uh, so a lot of activity taking place there. I don't know whether that might be some of the explosions we saw in my earlier video. So going back to, uh, to my map here, Tokmak is close, and if they are evacuating the FSB buildings there and other kind of headquarters, then they are evidently getting a little bit worried. Uh, is this just rumour? Well, 
uh, we what evidence do we have to support these kind of kinds of claims? Well, the Russians themselves are making some of these claims. So the north of Arakiva, a cluster of enemy equipment is moving at least 50 units, says uh, a Russian mill blogger. The enemy, that's the Ukrainians, are concentrating forces for a decisive blow he needs to go to Vobovi then to Tokmak so this is to say that there are huge amounts of, apparently of Ukrainian equipment massing around Orykhiv they need to hit Vobovi and then Tokmak is what that claim was uh, let's go back to uh, to look at further claims then um, this is Dmitry Rogozin, so another Russian source. At these minutes, there is a powerful attack on a Robotna settlement. 83 units of Western armored vehicles and a huge number of personnel are moving to attack. A powerful battle has begun. We pray for the guys. And then there's reference to Ger Geriman here, like the uh, horrible Russian source. Uh, armed forces of Ukraine are preparing for a decisive blow. The accumulation of the enemy equipment at Orokiv. So this is the at least 50 units caught on camera. Uh, that is the claim there. Some saying even more, uh, like 100 units there. So uh, after after Ukrainian forces have won the Robotna battle, the front line moving south and eastwards uh, to the outskirts of Novoprokopivka and Vobove, drone footage from Ukrainian convoy moving, Russian drone footage uh, of a Ukrainian convoy moving toward Orokiv, uh, Orokiv to Robotna. That is, the claim is up to 100 vehicles in that so uh, that is Orykiv to uh, robot uh, to Novopokropivka really this kind of area they're moving towards there perhaps 100 vehicles but actually there are further claims so David D talks about this if the Russian reporting is true reports were that 500 armored vehicles are were massed for a strike on the Robotna sector he says a normal battalion in command can have 100 vehicles uh, with the main unit you know, and then 31 to 35 of the main formation, 10 to 12 additional tanks, blah, 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 recovery vehicles. And he actually says, you know, a lot of those vehicles won't be, you know, assault vehicles. So one convoy of 85 plus vehicles ha has been spotted. So they could uh, have four to five battalions attacking at once. He's kind of playing around with numbers and, and working out exactly what's going on. Uh, he, he said it's going to be a long night. Uh, fight is ongoing. A huge, huge uh, amount of stuff. But you know, remember that, you know, here you've got two, four, six, eight, ten sort of tanks there, uh, one assumes, is supported by all of these other vehicles, a lot of, you know, supply vehicles, radars, anti-tank teams, mortar teams, fuel, ammo, cooks, food, mechanics, recon, blah, blah, blah. So when when you here talk about 100 vehicles or 500 vehicles it's it's understanding that you know not all of those are going to be say tanks and infantry fighting vehicles so on and so forth but a uh, really really uh interesting um uh as to what is going to be taking place today uh Pay attention to Robotny salient today. Ukraine has reportedly begun a large combined arms operation pushing towards Tokmak. This is the first major Ukrainian assault since the counteroffensive began at the end of spring. Uh, today is, is a big day, I think. The advance of the Ukrainian army in the direction of the village of Vobove and advance close to the defence line was recorded. Judging by personnel, the armed forces were not only able to gain a foothold near the defence line, but also gradually push the defenders away from the line itself and from the dugouts. Also, the armed forces of Ukraine took up positions in the south of the village of Robotna, knocking out the Russian forces in the village of Novopokopivka. The There were serious positions. Uh, so that is to say that they're moving as well in this direction towards Vobove and have made some advances uh, and are moving the Russians out to some of their dugouts there uh, in that area. So, yeah, lots of activity here. Right. Several Russians saw, now this is sorry, I'm moving on uh, from here. So there will be lots of activity going on here. I might have to keep you posted throughout the day if it's sort of major stuff. I don't know. Um, or is it all being over etc etc et, cetera, et cetera. Now we're going to come down to the Kherson area now. Uh, several Russian sources are highlighting a dangerous situation that is developing on the islands 
of the Dnipro River, where recon companies of the Russian 205th Brigade are ordered forward without any artillery support, resulting in their destruction by Ukrainians. First messages emerged when Russian mercenary with a call sign 13th, so we've re referred to him a number of times, published on his channel an audio message attacking the commander of the 205th Brigade. This was followed by four to five other channels confirming this information and also mentioning similar situations developing in a number of other units. Below is a big chat log provided by the Russian military reported by someone from the brigade. It is unclear which specific island they are talking about, but the area seems to be somewhere near Kherson. Right, I'm not going to go into that now, but things are not looking good for the Russians in this area. Indeed, to add to that, Osin Uri says, there is a bit of drama developing in the left bank of Kherson. It appears the units of the 205th are trapped and encircled on the island in the Kazachi Lahiri area, um, and the Russian uh, command stopped an attempt to rescue them. Uh, the Russian mill blogger Grey Zone, used to be associated with Wagner, writes the following. Um, 205th Brigade, right now our boys are being crushed on the island. Anything you can. Guys give goals, video goals, no one works. I don't quite know what that means. The guys identify targets, lead, send coordinates, but the information does not go further than the intelligence chief. The company commander and the soldiers tried to move forward to evacuate the guys. They were stopped. The company commander was sent to the mental hospital by force under the pretext that there is no one there. The whole company stood up for the company commander and now they are threatened with criminal charges. Two more commanders are support, were, who supported were closed. The guys were brought to the islands yesterday afternoon right under the fixation of the enemy. Uh, the brigade commander is afraid to report the situation to the top about the current situation. So yeah, you know, obviously Google Translate and all, all that, but you get the idea that, hey, things aren't looking good for the Russians in that area. And we, we've been struggling, or I've been struggling to work out exactly what's going on in the Kazachi Lahiri area because there was supposedly this salient, uh, or, or there was a, a bridgehead that the Ukrainians had gained here, and they were supposed to be sort of fighting both south towards Pidstepne and then. Uh, east towards Kazachi Lahiri and into Kazachi Lahiri. And then we heard that the Russians had pushed them fully out there. And we haven't really heard anything since. And we don't know who to believe. Or I don't know who to believe. And uh, uh, But it seems from Russian sources that in this area, don't know exactly where, uh, the Russians are under a lot of pressure. Okay, let's leave the front line uh, because there's an awful lot that, that could, could be discussed, but time. Right, military aid. And there's a lot to discuss here, let me tell you. Right. Okay, more good news for Ukraine. Norway is confirming it too will send F-16s to uh, to Kiev, to uh, Ukraine. They have pledged F-16 fighter aircraft and also RST surface-to-air missiles for the RST uh, surface-to-air missile system. That's a short-ranged one. Um, it, it appears that they're going to send 12 jets, the Norwegians. Uh, fantastic. So that will add to what looks to be 61. Not sure how many of those are operational that uh, the other countries have already, uh, Denmark and, and the Netherlands have, have pledged. Now, Portugal is going to add themselves to the coalition to train Ukrainian pilots on F-16s. They've confirmed it will join that coalition. Uh, that's really good news. Now, I, I don't know. This is like America going, yeah, no, we're not going to do that. No, we're not going to do that. No, we're not going to do that. Stop asking. We're not going to do that. Okay, we're going to do that loads. <laughs> like, uh, uh, <laughs> it seems to be how the US does stuff. No, 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 no. Yes, lots. Um, the New York Times writes that the US is now entering the international F-16 coalition after having decided to train Ukrainian pilots on F-16s in Arizona starting next month. It's like, yeah, we'll do that, and we'll do it next month in Arizona. Come on. Just, yeah, brilliant. I mean, great. Uh, Pentagon US to start training F-16s in October, so that's what next month means, October, um, uh, following an English language course for pilots, uh, Pentagon Press Secretary Pat Ryder has announced. So that's really significant. Um, the US will quick, quickly grant permission to other countries to transfer F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine. Uh, this became known as a result of a phone conversation between Biden and Zelensky. The conversation of the presidents took place yesterday. So the that could be why Norway's suddenly gone, yep, here's 12 F-16s. So it seems to be this: the dam is broken, and that's good news for Ukraine. Why it couldn't have broken six months ago, I don't know. Norway dedicates $140 million for Ukrainian energy infrastructure. Uh, that's adding to what we've already heard from Norway, F-16s and, and RST. Um, 
that is to ensure the import of gas and electricity to Ukraine. Uh, the funds will be distribu distributed through the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and are aimed at the repair, maintenance and critical of critical electricity infrastructure and emergency power supply in areas affected by hostilities. Right. Opposition party, Social Democrats in Sweden, they are the biggest party in Parliament, it want to send JAS-39 Gripen fighters to Ukraine after Sweden is allowed into NATO. So once Sweden gets accession to NATO, the opposition party, who, who you know, they aren't ruling, but they are saying, we want to send them. Sweden is waiting ratification for that NATO accession. Uh, leader Swedish Social Democrats Magdalena Andersson called for help to Ukraine with grip and fighters immediately. Uh, that's fantastic. Swedish uh, viewers, let me know what you think about this. Any details about that would be fab. The Swedish government now states that it is working on the issue of sending the jazz grip and to Ukraine. I presume this is, well, is this a confusion? Is it the actual ruling government or the opposition party? They need US permission for some of the parts, though. And a dead district says, if I recall correctly, this part is a jet engine. Uh, so as we've seen with whole bits of kit and, and ammunition, so, uh, you know, Germany wanted to send some Gepard ammunition that was that was manufactured in in Switzerland, so you have to ask Switzerland permission. Well, if if a if a whole airframe has significant parts that also have those, uh, you know, contractual obligations attached to them, then you have to it appears ask the US whether you can send a Swedish uh, fighter to Ukraine. Um, so, anyway, a government of Norway is handling is ha handing over anti aircraft missiles for the RST systems to Ukraine. So that was that that just to let you know what they look like and uh, a bit of information there. Right, um, then we come on to Germany. So uh, it's sometimes difficult to work out exactly what is meant by latest military aid. So Tim White here says Germany's latest military aid for Ukraine includes missiles for the Patriot air defense system. This isn't a. I don't think this is a newly uh, pledged bit of assistance. This is actually what they've now delivered. So, in addition, Berlin will supply ten drone detection systems, forty RQ thirty five high drone reconnaissance drones, sixteen Zetros trucks, and five hundred ten thousand cartridges for firearms. Uh, this is from pledged to delivered. So, it had already been pledged. Sixty four Patriot SAM missiles. Uh, is, is is a significant number of missiles there. And of course, they will be going through these because uh, Kiev, for example, is attacked on a on a regular basis. Okay, here is somewhere else uh, that you can use cluster munitions for. Some clever, I mean, goodness me, I wouldn't be taking apart a munitions and then uh, sellotaping them up. I'd just be like, I'm going to blow my hands off. Um, oh, thank you very much cup of tea marvelous uh I, i'd blow my hands off um but they are attaching these two drones cluster munitions out of the the shells of sub munitions as i should say and then using them to drop uh from from drones from quadcopters so you know a bit of ingenuity there uh getting getting these uh, these ieds where you can right okay sorry my print is going mental behind me there, there's an irony uh, that my uh, father-in-law, my partner's father, is called Ivan, uh, delivering the, the the tea there. I hope he's not working for the FSB. Uh, right, the Turkish company, this blew my mind yesterday. The Turkish company Baikar congratulated the GUR on Independence Day of Ukraine and gave them a Bayraktar TB2 for free, right? Now, the guy that runs that company is the son-in-law of Erdogan, the ruler of Turkey, and this is why I think Turkey and Erdogan are talking out both sides of mouth, but really actually supporting Ukraine rather a lot in in quite significant ways. Uh, his son-in-law is is a massive advocate for support of Ukraine, and he is in charge of Baikar. Anyway, the best gift for this special day is a new weapon that will destroy the enemy and defend our freedom and independence, the GUR replied. Now, what I wanted to say, I thought it, it was this part, but it's not. It, so what I heard yesterday, this wasn't the one that blew my mind. The claim is Baikar have given $100 million worth of uh, equipment to Ukraine, which is more than some European nations. It's just insane that. It just blew my mind. 
Here it is. So Oryx says the combined value of Bicar's equipment donations, discounts on TB2s and humanitarian aid amounts to approximately $100 million, which is more than what some NATO countries have given to Ukraine. Just absolutely incredible that. Um, but there you go. Uh, good stuff from them. Very significant. Uh, right. Greece has terminated a contract with Russia for technical support and maintenance of the Tor M1 and OSA AKM air defense systems. Greece has 21 Tor M1s and 38 OSA AKMs. It is possible an unknown amount will be supplied to Ukraine via third party countries. In other words, what you know, why are they, they stopping a maintenance contract with Russia? Like, why would they do that unless they, they want to get rid of those bits of kit? Okay, they might want to get rid of those bits of kit. Where would they be getting rid of them to? Oh, Ukraine. Uh, where's Zelensky just been visiting? Greece. Okay, interesting. Let's join the dot. So possibly some, some really very useful uh, air defense systems and their, their ordnance might find their way from Greece to Ukraine. Right, here, uh, this is doing the rounds quite a bit. Now, Russia is now deploying a 70-year-old T, 70 year old T 10 tanks at the front lines. Apparently, this footage suggests that T 10s are being uh, used. I mean, these were from the 1940s. They're still tanks, they can still drop some lead on you, etc., etc. Yep, there is all that. But what position must you be in that this is what you are, uh, are dusting off? Where are your newly produced T 90s? Where are your T-14 Armatas? Where, what are your tank factories doing at the moment? Are they able to make anything? So, and then you go back to looking at the number of tanks that have been hit over the last couple of days and see a big drop in tanks. And my claim is that they just don't have many. And then you're like, they're, they're, they're sending T-10s to the front lines. You put those things together and like one supports the other, doesn't it? Um, okay. Russian military com commissariats conducted a large-scale handover and enlistment notices to migrants in the South Urals, Russian media report. The event was organized together with the support of Oman Special Forces and took place in the Chinese market located in the metallurgical district of Chely uh, Chelyabinsk. Men who have citizenship but n uh, have not joined the military register were handed enlistment notices on the spot, and those who had previously received them but failed to respond were taken to the military enlistment office. Again, this is indicating that and we, we've seen uh, um, migrants being rounded up in places like Moscow, illegal, illegal and legal migrants rounded up and seemingly sent to enlistment offices. There's been talk about that. I've shown you video evidence of that. Uh, it, it looks like the, the Russians need soldiers in the same way that they need T T10 tanks. They need tanks. They need soldiers, and they are they are going everywhere uh, to get them. Uh, in terms of mobilizing or enlisting people, uh, there is a lot of crypto mobilization going on. So it's kind of like mobilizing without telling the public that they are mobilizing, and doing it under the bonnet. Right? Okay. Uh, or under the radar, I should say. Here, on to geopolitical bits of news. The Swedish fashion giant H&M has announced plans yesterday to begin reopening stores in Ukraine from November 2023. So that's really good. H&M's uh, Ukrainian stores have been shut since the start of Russia's full-scale full invasion. This, this does several things. First of all, it indicates that, that it indicates that H&M are secure in the knowledge that their stores won't get destroyed. You know, this this is a this is a business decision, but they need to be confident that their stores are gonna are gonna be safe. Now, this means that there must be a general belief that Ukraine is broadly safe, particularly in the West, that that no longer are there these fears that that Russia will be able to take control uh, of Ukraine. That that is now a pipe dream of Putin's, and that that dream receded within within a week, really, of the start of the war, uh, uh, and so that that gives them the confidence to go and set up shop, literally, it, back in places I, I assume like Lviv, maybe uh, Kiev as well. I don't know. Uh, it also uh, shows that you, Ukraine is trying to get on with normal life as well as being 
in in a massive war. Uh, this will help to you know generate economic uh, stimulus, so on and so forth. That would be good for tax revenues and all sorts of stuff. You want a functioning economy, uh, which is so difficult when when you're on a war footing. Um, but yeah, uh, Heineken will immediately leave Russia after the brewer sold the Russian branch of the company for one euro to Arnest Group, a well-known Russian company. We took good care of our people and leave in a responsible manner, says Heineken CEO. I reported on Heineken previously that they had tried to divest some of their um, interests in uh, in Russia by sort of offloading them to other people. And then they were trying to get out, but it just took them a bit of time. Anyway, it seems like that they've got rid of the uh, the Russian branch for, for one euro. So uh, uh, I d- uh, it's good that, I guess, Western money isn't going into Russia to then be... Uh, ha- to then help the, the war effort. Uh, rather that's just Russian money within Russia just swilling around and being extracted by the Russians from Russians to do Russian stuff. You don't want inward investment because that is, uh, you know, a way of of the West supporting Russians, Russia's war effort. Right. Slovenia's joined the G7 declaration on support for Ukraine security guarantees. So another nation that signed up to uh, future security guarantees that, that were put forward uh, in uh, at the G7 summit now, uh, or, or was that put forward at Vilnius actually? Now, uh, this is yeah, Michael Weiss. I think he's quite correct here. This is Vivek Ramaswamy after the uh, uh, the Republican nominee uh, presidential candidate debate. Right, Trump wasn't there, but but a bunch of the others were. Now, some people said he did the best in the debate. Other people say he was smarmy and was 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 not didn't come across too well it depends you know where you sit and what your opinions are uh but he, when he was asked by uh Ost- ostap yarish uh why what what he thinks about um about ukraine this is what he said and do you know what this makes me angry uh i don't i didn't like him before i like him even less now right check this out What's that? Why are you against supporting Ukraine? Because it does not advance American interests. And as the U.S. president, I'm not running for any other role other than looking after the interests of America. So that's wrong. It does advance American interests. That's exactly why America helping. America are not, and I've said this uh, countless times, America are not helping out of just moral kindness. I mean, they would help a bit out of that, but they're not putting this much effort into supporting Ukraine just because, hey... uh, I think we should help you. You guys are nice guys. You're in, you're in a bit of trouble. They are helping because it's in the US's geopolitical interest to do so. So he is exactly wrong here. This is like, this is naivety. Uh, or either, either he doesn't know this and doesn't realize this, in which case he's stupid. And I'm going to just say that he's either stupid or he's lying and, and therefore is disingenuous. So you're either stupid or you're disingenuous. Either way, I don't like you. I don't, I don't like you know you. I I I don't like you because you're stupid. But you shouldn't be running for president if you if you are this dense geopolitically speaking. However, my plan to end the Ukraine war will actually be probably better for Ukraine. At least it comes out with sovereignty intact. How so? Which is not the plan they're on right now. You mark my words. Just absolute nonsense. As if the plan right now is not to give Ukraine sovereignty. That's the exact plan. It's just. Oh. The way this war ends right now without the U.S. actually stepping in and saying we're not going to fund any more of it is going to be some post-Zelensky warlord takes over with a couple hundred billion dollars of American military equipment, just like what happened after the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. And you see how far that got. Oh, my God, that's so wrong. It's A, it's a false equivalence. This is nothing like Afghanistan. There, there aren't the Taliban waiting to take over. Zelensky has a pretty secure government. They've got a, a functioning democracy, and it's an outside force that's invading that wants to take over. So that military equipment won't then fall into some post-Zelensky warlord. There, there aren't going to be warlords in Ukraine. It's a if, if Ukraine prevail, it will be a functioning democracy supported by the Western NATO and the EU. Seeking accession to the EU. This is just, I, I'm really angry with this man. He's a tool. He's an absolute tool.
No one should support him for president. If they do, they're equally toolish. Sorry. Right. This is going on to Wagner in Africa. Putin had personally told Tudera, the, or Tudera, the Central African Republic president, uh, that the time has, had come to distance himself from Prigozhin. When Tudera visited St. Petersburg last month, he abstained from taking a selfie with the Russian warlord. Interesting. So this is looking like Putin you know, had plans afoot. Since June, the Kremlin had been trying to assert control over the shadowy web of murky arrangements. The Defence Ministry had been dispatching delegations to inform foreign governments that they would henceforth do business directly with the Russian state, i.e. not with Wagner. Prigozhin's mutiny had left Haftar, the Libyan warlord who had paid Wagner for securing its oil wells and territory, and his close circle nervous about Wagner's presence in Libya. They felt that if they do it in Russia, they can do it in Benghazi. In other words, if Prigozhin can do a mutiny in Russia with his own, you know, military and, you know, kind of a coup with his own leader, then actually what could they do in Libya? Uh, Prigozhin's death doesn't change anything, a Nigerian intelligence of, of, of official, so not Nigerian, Nigerian, Nigerian intelligence uh, official said, Russia is still there. When the Wagner leader is gone, they are still active in Africa. Maybe now the Kremlin's hands will be more strengthened. Uh, Prigozhin said, I need more gold, according to a Sudanese official familiar with the conversation. Wow. Um, so that is the situation in in Africa. I have said that Wagner are no more, that they, they, they are now not a thing. And all of their African entities, I imagine, will be taken uh, under the wing of newly created uh, private military companies that are operating on behalf of the MOD in Russia. Just, you know, different name. Same job, different name. Without Prigozhin. Okay, Pentagon says Wagner are no longer a factor on the battlefield in Ukraine. I would take that one step further and say they're no longer a factor, full stop. The combat effectiveness of the Wagner group is no longer a factor in Russia's war against Ukraine. Pentagon spokesperson Pat Ryder said during a press conference uh, when asked about Prigozhin. Uh, I'd agree. Uh, now, I talked about BRICS yesterday. BRICS meeting has been going on in South Africa. New composition of BRICS will control. So th this is taking on board that Argentina, Iran, uh, Ethiopia, UAE, United Arab Emirates, and Saudi Arabia are going to join BRICS on June the 1st, 2024. BRICS will now control 80% of the world oil production. With the addition of Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Iran to BRICS, the union will be able to control the lion's share of the world's oil production. The same goes for the sharp GDP growth of the new BRICS countries. It will amount to 30% of the world's GDP and exceed 30 trillion. Right. That's a worry. Uh, it really is a geopolitical worry. I, some people are saying you don't need to worry about BRICS, blah, blah, blah. I do worry about BRICS. And I think this is one of the main reasons to worry. Uh, this should get people, you know, my opinion is that with the uh, of, with what happened at the beginning of the war and the hydrocarbon crisis, Britain, I don't know why we didn't go, I don't know why every country didn't do stuff like this. We, what we did straight away, Boris Johnson went to all these other places like Saudi Arabia, UAE, and, and with cap in hand saying, can we have your oil? It's like, yeah, I'm not sure the human rights are any better here than in Russia, to be honest. But, you know, you're going to all these other places to get more oil and, and Venezuela and here and there. Okay, what we should have done, maybe do that to get short-term uh, supply of, of the energy that we need. But at the same time, we should have been going, right, we need to properly uh, get energy independence. And that might be del diving into like green tech and whatever. So every new house, and in the moment, every new house in the UK has like, has to have uh, an amount of like solar pa power or heat pumps or whatever. So new builds. But what I was speaking to a solar panel guy the other day, and he said, it's really annoying. They put like two panels on top of a roof and they put them in the middle of the roof. So you can't then put other panels because they're just in the wrong place. They should put like five times as much. And then the whole house is rather than having just a little bit being generated, all of the house is electricity because lobbying from fuel companies, blah, blah, blah. But the government, UK government and the US and every other government should be at the point now where like, okay, oil is looking a bit dodgy going forward. I'm not talking about from an environmental point of view. I'm talking about from a security point of view. So let's make sure every new building in the in the UK, for example, has not two uh, 
two solar panels on top, but 10 solar panels on top, depending on the size of the roof. Let, let's, you know, just, just do it. Regulate it, get it done, and let's let's make let's make our solar industry absolutely massive because our our oil is looking a bit dodge from you know all around the world, etc., etc. You know, there, well, there's a will, there's a way, and necessity is the mother of all invention, etc., etc. Yeah, we should be taking this opportunity to to do other things really boldly and in a big way uh, because stuff like this worries me. You know. 80% of the world's oil production under the, the control of bricks. Uh, it ain't a good thing. Anyway, that's that's me having another rant. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, please like, subscribe, share. I really appreciate all of your support. Uh, take care and I'll speak to you soon.